We call it earth energy, don't we, us dowsers? But what is it? We go off hunting high and low with the best possible intentions. But what is it that we're all finding and how do we explain it to people who don't douse? I spoke recently with Rory Duff, a geobiologist, about his dowsing experience and how he has come to identify different types of earth energy based on his scientific knowledge. Hello there, my name's Tim Walter. I'm a house healer and an alternative life coach. I'm about looking at a fundamental shift of perception in your life for improved well-being using meditation, mindfulness and dowsing. Dowsing is the easiest and most accessible way to start accessing the power of your intuition. Have a look at the videos on my channel, try it for yourself, and if it's the sort of thing that you're after, do click subscribe and say hello in the comments beneath all the videos. Also, check out my sister channel, Your Home Heals, where you'll find lots of lovely professional house healers that I've trained personally wanting to help you and Mother Earth as part of this expanding universal consciousness that we're all experiencing. Now, recently I spoke with geobiologist Rory Duff to hear about his research and his categorization of Earth energy lines. Inevitably, it was a conversation that covered far more than just earth energy, and there's plenty in here for both the novice and the expert dowser. So we started by talking about Rory's background and how he got into this magical world of dowsing. Rory, thank you so much for coming along. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this, I have to say. I suspect that we've got far more to talk about than we can cover in the time that we've got today, but. First of all, for those people that haven't heard of you at all, could you tell us who you are and how you got into this wonderful world of dowsing and what it means to you? Well, uh, Tim, thank you very much for, for inviting me, first of all. Um, yes, where should we start? Well, uh, again, I think it's just uh, an initial surprise that everyone gets when, when they're first introduced to dowsing. It's like a shock. Oh, what? What's, and I was shocked first with the an Italian geologist who I was working with on the mines in Africa. He used to get rung up by the local farmers uh, to go looking for, for water for their land. So they drill and, and put a wind pump up and, and just pump the water up. And um, he said, come Rory, we go, we go look for water. And his name was Paolo. And um, anyway, he took his car out to one place and um, he, he lifted the, bo the, the boot up and brought these rods out. And I said, but what are you doing? <laughs> He said, oh, we know it's here, Rory. We just don't know precisely where. And, and that was my introduction. But, but um, more importantly, it was, it was a really important lesson that stayed with me in dowsing, which is what I actually really bang home a lot when I, when I teach people now. And that is the importance of feedback. Because even though you get a rod movement and you think you've found water, you haven't until you've drilled it. And it's the importance of, of actually getting the water or proving that your dowsing is right. And that feedback is, is critical. And we used to practice on, on the, the golf courses and, and the, um, the lawns on, on the mine uh, because they all have sprinkler systems and they have pipes which fed it. And so you could douse for the water in the pipes or you could douse for the pipes itself. And then you take your dowsing rod and stick it down into the ground to see whether you, you were actually hitting the pipe. And that was brilliant feedback. And uh, we, we taught, everybody we could <laughs> to do this um but that kind of when i left that work i, I kind of didn't do any more dowsing but uh, when, when i was back to this country my, my interest started beca becoming interested in consciousness i mean I, some really big changes hit me in in africa and i i fortunately through synchronicity discovered the work of rudolf steiner uh, and his science of the spirit so f for me uh I think uh, you know I'd been immersed in, in in religions when I was young, and it didn't really sort of uh, take, or uh, there was a lot of uh, questions unanswered. And so this this concept of the science and the spirit becoming uh, is somehow entwined. It had to had to be a connection of sorts. And Steiner was sort of put me on that passage, and and that led me in in a hobby to study consciousness and. The, the first thing that made me sit up uh, and take more notice when science was was when uh, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff started uh, 
positing that uh, consciousness might actually exist within uh, microtubules uh, and, and uh, some sort of quantum coherence would be uh, able to be sustained within these these uh, walls of, of these uh, tiny little things inside our, our neurons, isn't it? These microtubules. And that um, electrical propagation through the walls uh, would um, some just collapse it. So you, you collapse the wave function and create re re create reality. And, and he was talking about a form of uh, objective reduction and orchestrated reduction. I won't, I won't go too much into it, but I, I thought, okay, so maybe consciousness can reside in the brain. And I started off thinking, well, is this even possible when you, when you think about uh, how, how do all the other things like survival after death and, and, and uh, telepathy and these things fit in? And I began to realize, well, actually mainstream science doesn't cover this. It fails completely. It says that mind is part of brain function, and that's that. Uh, and yet I was doing Aikido and studying and learning about key energy. And at that point, uh, I, I began to start thinking, well, maybe key and gravity is, is very similar because, you know, the, the key point in, in Aikido is at the center of your body's gravity. So I started looking at how might key energy be linked to gravity. And, and at that point, um, as 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 life dictates you you come across information you need to know and i came across uh, hamish's book uh, the son of the serpent and of course then from going from uh, human chi and key energy i was introduced to the earth's chi energy and, and i looked at uh, this book and i thought heck i'm not far from these lines i can douse so so i spent an hour and a half first off around the uh, holy cross church in Crelliton in devon where we were living then and uh, found that the Michael line pretty easily took me ages to find the Mary line <laughs> just 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 the whole thing about it was a bit different uh, and I, I just put that down to me being a bloke and not feminine enough to, <laughs> to, to pick up the, the the Mary line but that that enabled me to to just literally pretty much study all the main sites from Cornwall up through to to Avery um, and just tuning in what were they about and I, I actually did an exercise of looking at the where these lines were and I began to see there was a, a connection between the relative high ground area so if you had a, a a flat Somerset level the relative high grounds would be the, the Black Borough Mump and the Glaston, Glaston Retour it, it, the lines seemed to be uh, moving towards these high grounds even um, if you look at the Wellington Monument on, on the, the Blackdown Hills just off of the M5, you, you see the Michael line actually took a, a 45 degree detour. And that's what, what Hamish writes about in his book. So I, I went there and found that was the case. And again, I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe this is like gravity in reverse. Uh, it's like a, the, this, this needle like statue is, is like a lightning conductor for the energies going outwards, possibly. So I began to think maybe this, this, there's a connection here between gravity and, and, and chi energy. And uh, so that was what I was exploring. Um, and, and then another piece of synchronicity happened, which was a meeting a, a chap called Ron Pearson, at a genius of a man. I mean, he was he's your original rocket scientist. He invented the gas wave turbine. He'd, he'd retired early and he'd, he'd, he'd come across the Big Bang Theory and became an engineering physicist and cosmologist, but he saw all these huge flaws in the Big Bang Theory and pointed them out. To, one of them was Professor Davis and, and pointed that Ga, Ga, Alan Guth's maths were, was wrong and, and um, they, they kind of like went very quiet about this because, of course, he'd been given a, a Nobel Prize. But... Um, uh, he, he decided to find a better way for creation of, of the universe. Um, and the this, this strange thing was that it, it came to him and all the maths came to him, but it had this other sort of awkward side effect was that it also explained how intelligence must have arisen behind the universe and how the intelligence actually went on, on at a sub-quantum level to create the, the quantum worlds through uh, uh, basically uh, waves of, of, of of uh, vibrations interacting, creating this larger particle on, on, on the, uh, the, the larger, on the larger quantum scale, and, and this kind of like began to explain everything uh, from there on. And, and then his theory blossomed into a theory of quantum gravity. But his problem, the second problem, was that he didn't. In fact, he didn't need to use relativity theory. So it took him a long time to to, to get published anywhere. But and I came along really helping him write put all his uh, 
is work into sort of sensible understanding of science. So it, he, he wrote six books and I helped him do this. Just to, I was just challenging him all the time for understanding things. And um, he, he eventually produced this work and we put it to uh, another great chap, uh, Professor uh, Brian uh, Josephson from the Cavendish Labs in Cambridge. He's a Nobel Prize winning physicist and uh, he couldn't find any flaws to this theory. He just didn't like it because it wasn't relativity theory. And, and, and um, the, the other thing about his theory was it began to explain all these other effects like telepathy, survival after death, uh, uh, the, how the mind can live on. And from, from a scientific viewpoint, it completed all the maths and he'd done all of it. And the, and the guy was an utter genius. Uh, to just watch him in work is incredible. So I was in heavily immersed in, in seeing, my goodness, this is now giving giving us uh, an understanding to, to consciousness in a way which has never been shown before. And at that stage, having moved up here, I was also getting into, this is Wiltshire area, I, I was then taken by a, a particular line at the end of the, um, the book, The Sun and the Serpent, where, where Hamish mentions he meets a chap called Brian Green, I think it was, who said he'd found another energy line coming off of the uh, Avebury. And entering and ending in a little sort of a clump of trees uh, and wind some spirals and I thought well I'm going to go and check that out I haven't seen that before and I spent the next 18 months following that line because uh, it didn't end at the trees and, and, uh, and its pair and I followed those two lines all the way into South Wales uh, and all the way up the other side to the east of the country and, and uh, made huge numbers of mistakes trying to, trying to find them but as you do um, but that was like the beginnings of my uh, looking into earth energy lines. And from, I thought, well, the only way I'm going to learn more is to try and understand what reality looks like. And as a geologist, I, I, I find mapping things pretty easy. I decided to choose an area of, and just map everything in that from the point of view of the energies. So that, that started a six year project of just mapping uh, all these, these energy lines uh, that I could find and, uh, and seeing what, what, it, what was there. Um, and then it became apparent that there's an awful lot of intersections. But there aren't that many sacred sites. I mean, you, there's not a sacred site at every single intersection. Um, but then one of, my, one of the lines passed very close to where I lived. And, and I used to take my, my dog out for a walk at 8 o'clock every morning. So I, I actually put a, a datum with, with a tape measure down across the drive. And, and with a piece of chalk, I would mark the... Two, two edges of this energy line every, every day for 70 days. I did this at eight o'clock and tried to see what was going on. And it, it, it had this slight movement. Um, that then progressed into having to measure it every hour. And as soon as I started measuring every hour, there was this very clear side to side movement. And I thought, well, I, my goodness, I mean, why has no one seen this before? And then it didn't take long before I realized actually this movement from side to side doesn't occur at the nodes and at the sacred sites. The nodes and the sacred sites anchor it rather like the guitar string has frets and things like that. You, you, you've got this point where you, if you're only going to find this if you're actually between two sacred sites in the middle of nowhere. So my dowsing progressed to being working, for instance, in industrial estates and, and fields in the middle, just, just, to, just to find the, the side to side movements. And it wasn't long before I realized that actually they're, they're different frequencies from different lines of different frequencies and then the michael and mary line had a 12 hour frequency one way 12 hours the other way so uh, if, if you think of that in terms of uh hertz you know that's a, a one hertz is like one movement from one side to the other in a second and two hertz is like twice as fast in a second two, uh, this is a movement which is so slow we're down in the microhertz region and and then you start looking at hang on a minute what's causing this if you're going to have these things it's got to constantly have a source of energy and 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 just as the magnetic poles rotate as the earth rotates uh, and and they stay in that same place the earth energy lines are also rotating with the earth so something had to be coming from the center of the earth constantly providing a source of, of energy and at, at, at the microhertz level it's far too far too slow for any electronic instrument to pick up. In fact, the, the closest we get is super cool gravimeters that, that are embedded into the ice in Antarctica and left for weeks just to pick up these very low vibrations and they can get down to about two and a half thousand microhertz. 
But what became interesting was they found something that I was finding with the different frequencies. Right. It, you got the energy lines that, that had frequencies of 24 hours, ones at 16 hours, 14, 12, 10, 8, 6. But you had none at like 18, 19, 20, 21. There was a gap. There were gaps between them. And then there were, there were lots of groups of lines, like the type 3 lines would, 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 would move between 12 hours to 16 hours over the course of, of, of the year and back. So they had frequencies. Uh, and I, I actually studied 12 lines for 18 months every day so with the dog every morning. And that's when I started realizing that some of these lines uh, came into harmony. Where you, they, they, the, of a certain type, they would all reach one end of their range of movement at exactly the same time in the morning and then exactly the same time in the afternoon. And that, that harmony time would last for generally a couple of days. And, that, and you could group the different lines with their, with their different frequencies in their harmony time. So you knew that the lines were slightly different. Um, and then you begin to realize actually that the, the Michael and Mary lines are a lot rarer. The type, we, I call them the type four because there are only about 12 pairs, 13 pairs in the UK. Um, everyone knows the Michael and Mary one, but there, there's quite a few other ones. Um, and then there's the type three lines, which are a lot more common. And then the type ones and twos are more common too. But what that began to answer the question, well, it's where the, the bigger lines cross. It drew in all the smaller ones. So if you take A, for instance, if, if you've got the, the Michael and Mary crossing over, but you also have eight pairs of type three, twos and ones. Like. So there's a lot of the smaller lines crossing there. Uh, and although the, the, you do get it, uh, interesting smaller sites you know without the, the type fours and and there are wonderful chapels for instance there's, there's one of the smallest churches in, in, in gloucestershire a lovely place called Bremelham church which is about the size of your sitting room it's got a, a beautiful uh, a collection of type one lines there uh, and, and a very powerful delicate place but just with one type of line so it began to sort of okay so what, what's happening here with these different frequencies and um uh, and what are these energies? That's the other thing. Uh, and that, that, the connection was made with vibrations because I'd come across the fact that uh, iron and nickel was a, a wonderful transducer. It's used in microphones and, and speakers. It converts one form of energy to another form of energy. So if you've got a, an iron and nickel in a core within a, uh, in a solid in a core, within a, a, a liquid outer core, you have, have this ability for this core to expand and contract and, and, and give off this, this very, very low frequency vibrations um, with, with, with high pressure zones, just like a, 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 an echo and sound on an audible level. And, and, and these high pressure zones, when you start looking at spherical uh, sound waves, they do represent on the surface with linear high pressure concentrations. Um, but then the inner core had another effect. It, it has a, me a mechanical filtering effect. Iron is, is a very good mechanical filter. What that means is when it's used, uh, uh, when you put electricity in it, it will only produce certain frequencies and it'll produce gaps between those frequencies. And that's exactly what they were picking up in the gravimeters in the Antarctic. They were, they were finding eigen modes of frequencies, but then gaps between the two. And these were about the eighth or ninth octave above the actual frequencies of the fundamentals of, the, of all the different groups of the energy lines. So you, you, can, you can see that if, if, if the, the inner core, which, which by definition is a certain density and size, any kind of energy coming into it will be transduced into an array of eigen mode frequencies and we're picking them up on the surface as different energy lines with different widths and different frequencies and the the, the geologists are picking them up in, in antarctica antarctica are, are, are with their uh, super core gravimeters but that then left well what are the, what is the energies that's supplying the core and and this is a hypothesis so you know we just got to go with the fact that the outer core is where there's a lot of electromagnetic energy that's actually naturally going to be pushing energy into the inner core. So that's one source. But then the other source is because the, because the, the type four and, and the other lines, bigger lines, we think that the source is neutrinos. Right. When, when, when cosmic rays hit the atmosphere, 
they, they convert it into a variety of uh, secondary particles and, and, and some of them are gamma rays, some of them are neutrinos. And neutrinos are very high energy, almost massless particles that shoot straight through the earth. They're, they're not very long lived, but they're, they're long enough lived to go through the earth and, and they get picked up as uh, things called uh, Cherenkov radiation. And again, observations in, in, um, in Antarctica, the one called Ice Cube that has several arrays of detectors picking up neutrinos to detect uh, a sort of image of what the what the Earth in its inside looks like. And they call it something called acoustic tomography. But it, again, it shows that it, the, these neutrinos do seem to be slightly deflected by the inner core, and that would then give them this energy. So that would supply energy to the inner core. That's another source of energy, which would then be displayed in some of the some of the larger lines. And we think maybe that the cosmic energy from the sun is producing the type four lines that gives it that 12 hour, 12 hour, one way, the other way. And the galactic sources of, of neutrinos from uh, from deeper space were probably producing the, the, the really big emperor dragons, which are the type five lines, which we, uh, we found back in 2012. That's another long story. So that that, that kind of explains that, that also this uh, the strangeness about these energy lines, where if you've got two lines at different directions, uh, uh, the movement wasn't one way and the other way. It was it was it was, it was out and back like this, and and that was only really explained by if you think about a, a, a balloon and drawing a. a, a black triangle with an indelible marker on it and then blowing the balloon up and then releasing it the air you've got this expansion and contraction and, and if you think of that now being a, a, a shadow of the of the workings down in the inner core we're picking up that expansion and contraction with the earth with, with these things moving on the surface but this didn't explain this is just just made it all vibrations and, and so so why was there a sacred site to this what how did that connect and, and this is where the beauty of Ron's work came in, which was you know, the fact that at that very basic level of, in the subquantum, uh, that's where the intelligence uh, arose through his uh, think what, it, what was called opposed energy dynamics. That that connected these vibrational waves to universal consciousness. So when you've got these very very slow vibrations, this is like a direct link to universal consciousness. So where you where you now have the intersections of these these, these lines, uh, if they're symmetrical intersections where you create this cylinder of energy and you've got a, uh, everything the sort of temper images talk about as well, the, these columns and the, and the toruses forming, and uh, you, you then find that when you when you connect in meditation with your own heart resonance, uh, with the resonance of the energy, that that seems to allow the mind and the heart mind and the, and the, and the head mind if I like, to completely connect with the universal consciousness and and that begins to explain some of the amazing things that some people are managing to do at these places um and that that just sets you off on this huge journey where where dowsing is 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 more than just dowsing these energy lines because it's a connection here between, between your consciousness and the universal consciousness and 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 and, and it is very much like this is, is one of communication now because you, you, you ask your questions in, in a focused state and you switch to that aware state to try and get information back from, from the subconscious mind. So that whole focus aware state leads beautifully. And one of, one of the things that I was loving about, about dowsing is that it was an entry point for so many people. It, it takes people into that whole realms of spirituality. It takes them into the communication uh, it, uh, with other beings and, and, and higher, 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 um, higher beings and all that. And uh, it adds so much value, healing. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, no, I'm, 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 <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm Rory. I could listen to you all day. It's just great. I don't know whether you were thinking in, in that. Does he want me to carry on saying this or not? But uh, um, okay, so what we're saying there is we've got you, you've uh, classified like five aspects of Earth's energy into, into, into uh, uh, type one to type five lines, but presumably you've, you, you've got others. Uh, yeah, and, and just very quickly, that, that is very much that the energy is based on the uh, inner core, but then there's, there's another whole set of energy energy lines, which I think are more grid-like, which are more surface-like features, which uh, f for me are more electromagnetic in nature. 
and here we, we will we'll talk about the more well-known Hartman Curry lines, the bank grid lines, and the, and the hexagonal honeycomb grid lines. And, and for me, the very much more, I, I think the science behind that indicates that the interacting magnetic fields from the sun and the earth cause Birkeland currents. These naturally travel down into the ground. They're called ground induction currents or, or telluric currents. Um, typically, we have it known in science that the, the north, south, east, west to, uh, ground induction currents are called Hall and Peterson currents. And I suspect they are creating on a more smaller scale, local scale, these these grids that we find, the banker grids and the Hartman Curry grids. Um, and, and, um, and also there's another aspect of David Cowan's work, which, which uh, is linked between the earth and the sun, uh, more with the sort of transformer uh, type of uh, energy transfer where you've got uh, uh, coil-like uh, interactions on the sun and the earth with regards to large loops creating uh, electromagnetism and, and trans a transformer effect. And that's why we think that his picking up uh, energies running from one volcanic plug to another volcanic plug uh, along faults with, 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 with dikes and things like that. In that you, you've got an element of paleomagnetism within some of the iron, uh, uh, iron uh, lava flows. There's lots of ferromagnetic materials in these things which will cool. And as these minerals cool, there's a natural paleomagnetic direction and that could be enough to uh, channel uh, electromagnetism. And, and a form of energy it's a, and, and explain why Dave is finding those things. Steiner begins to explore this whole relationship between uh, the consciousness, subconscious mind and the super sensible world. As I show people how easy it is to make it all up. Well, what am I looking for when I'm looking for Earth energy? Those different frequencies are not different dimensions. We shouldn't perhaps live in these places. There's a huge suppression on the evidence for survival after death. Freedom from the fear of death is the key that unlocks humanity's chains.